Welcome to our webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAS. My name is Christy Miner. I am the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community Practice Coordinator for CCAS. And for those who are unfamiliar, CCAS is a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges such as introduced aquatic species. CCAS supports a few different communities of practice, one of which is this non-native aquatic species community practice that we launched in May of 2020. Um, if anyone would like more information on CCAS or on any of our communities of practice, uh, feel free to email me or Matt Graybaugh, who couldn't be here, um, but will still be responsive to emails when he returns. Um, and Carly is gonna go ahead and put some emails into the chat box so that everyone can access them. Uh, webinars like these are one way that we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. Uh, so today we are very excited to host a presentation from Chad Teal, who will discuss the development of YY Redshiner for invasive population control. Chad is a PhD candidate studying fisheries conservation and management at the University of Arizona. His research specializes in aquaculture, genetics, and fisheries management. Chad also received his master's degree from the University of Miami, where he researched marine fin fish production and aquaculture sustainability. So just one final reminder, um, in case anyone trickled in late, if you have questions during the presentation, please just put those into the chat box and we'll relay them to the speaker after the presentation. Uh, so with that, Chad, I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Christy. I appreciate, I really appreciate you all tuning in to my presentation. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So um, let me see here. Yeah, so I'm working on developing um, YY males for two species, um, red shiner and green sunfish. And um, the this all this research is just part of my dissertation work here with the University of Arizona. Um, my advisor is Dr. Scott Bonar, um, but many many people have helped me throughout this project, and um, it's it's been a very collaborative effort. So red shiner, even though they're beautiful, uh, this picture actually of this male red shiner was taken by Heidi Blasius, who is who was on the webinar I saw. Um, they're beautiful, but they're a big problem here in the, in the desert southwest for many species of high conservation concern. They've been uh, implicated in the decline of many um, aquatic species, and they once they become established, they can thrive in degraded habitats. They have a very high thermal tolerance, so they're uh, particularly invasive here in Arizona and um, with climate change. So the question is, how can we effectively and also selectively eradicate invasive populations of red shiner without it impacting the species that we are trying to protect? So the tool set that we have currently with fisheries management is oftentimes, um, you know, going in using nets, setting traps, uh, just kind of doing everything we can. So mechanical removal um, requires a lot of effort and it can be extremely expensive. It requires people out on the ground, uh, out on the landscape doing this. So, you know, electrofishing, netting, and depending on the system you're in, this can be highly ineffective. Then we get into chemical treatments like with pesticides, and now these are more effective but they're not selective at all, right? So what about genetic approaches? Um, you know, there's gene editing and, and CRISPR with gene drives. These are effective. They're extremely controversial, obviously. Um, and we're, the science is just, we're just not there. We're not comfortable as a scientific community yet to really be utilizing this in as population control for vertebrates at this time. Then some of you might be familiar with um, a genetic strategy called the daughterless carp strategy, where you incorporate aromatase inhibiting um, genetic code into uh, 
into a fish and then they're unable to produce a male or they're unable to produce female offspring. And this has been looked at extensively in Australia where carp can, uh, you know, make up a lot of the biomass of the rivers in parts of Australia. Um, so the thing is, this is modeled to take a very long time to be effective. So, you know, multiple decades before you actually start to see a population decline. And it also is genetic engineering, the Darla's carp strategy. So we are exploring the Trojan sex chromosome eradication strategy. Um, so this is what this is, is just releasing either YY males, also known as super males, or YY females into an invasive population. And so what happens when these YY males mate with or spawn with a wild type female is that you will only get male offspring from that cross. And so these are just individuals that are homozygous for the male coding region. You can also phenotypically sex reverse a YY individual. So it's an egg bearing YY fish and have them spawn with wild type individuals in your in your study system or in your system that you're managing and the benefit of that is that 50 percent of the cross from that will um, roughly will be these super males and so these will continue to propagate this um eradication strategy by producing just all males so eventually the sex ratio with enough introductions of these YY fish is going to skew that population towards all male and make it inviolable. So some advantages of the Trojan sex chromosome strategy over other, other genetic approaches is that it's faster than the Dauntless carp strategy. It uh, uses genetic control of nuisance populations without the use of transgenic individuals or CRISPR or any gene editing and it's relatively low risk. It requires consistent input of YY fish into your system in order for it to be effective. So if these fish get into their native habitat, it's not gonna introduce any deleterious alleles that are gonna spread quickly into that um, population. So there have been several models that have come out in the um, literature recently that have showed this to be theoretically effective at suppressing and even eradicating invasive populations of species. And these species, brand, uh, the breadth of these species life history um, is expansive. So lots of different breeding strategies and all of them have shown that incorporating different management strategies and also using YY fish can be highly effective at eradicating these uh, invasive populations. So my funding for this project comes from the US Bureau of Reclamation and uh, our goal is to try to work on invasive population management in the Gila River Basin. So we wanted to take this theoretical um, uh, approach and apply it to the species that are impacting the Gila River Basin. But you have a problem with, re with red shiner, but how do you make these YY males? What is the actual process of producing YY males? Well, we can, many of you by, might be familiar with uh, studies where they're seeing pharmaceuticals or industrial runoff getting into effluent that flows into streams and rivers that can cause feminization of fish. So fish are pretty susceptible to exogenous steroids, endocrine disruptors, and xenobiotics that can shift um, the phenotype towards female. So we can exploit that and actually produce egg-bearing males. And so what happens is we take wild-type fish, spawn them together. While the fish are developing, we can feed them estradiol-treated feeds so this is just a form of, of estradiol. And what will happen is those genetic males, those XY males will develop into phenotypic females. So then we need a genetic sex ID marker, or we have to do tons of progeny testing and, and validation crosses in order to make sure we have XY males or XY females. 
But if we have a genetic sex ID marker, we can select these XY females, these neo females, and spawn them with wild type males. So if you remember your Punnett squares from back in the day, your XY fish is going to spawn with another XY fish, and 25% of your fish are going to be YY males from that cross. We can then again do another sex reversal, feed these larvae with estradiol treated food, and your YY fish are going to develop into phenotypic females. So your sex ID marker is going to hopefully allow you to select YY individuals as well that can then breed with untreated YY males. And so then there's only one genotype that can result from this cross, and that's going to be our super males, our YY males. And that would be what you release into um, your stream, and they'll hopefully seduce all those um, oblivious uh, wild type females and produce only male offspring. We can also sex reverse all the offspring from this cross with estradiol and then stock those into your, um, into your system. And so, you know, another strategy which may be more effective. But what it comes down to is why why fish should only be able to produce male offspring and through enough introductions and enough uh, traditional removal efforts, you can actually uh, keep a population suppressed and extirpated this way. But what do you need to know for this species in order to produce YY fish? So it seems pretty cut and dry, right? You're just doing sex reversals and that's it. But the thing is, species vary based off of their amenability for captive rearing and aquaculture based off of their susceptibility to sex reversals and especially their sex determination systems. So you need to know how to produce these fish. At what age do you start the estradiol treatment and for how long? Because not only can you have incomplete sex reversals where you don't have a sexually functional fish, but you can e even um, kill your fish with too much estradiol and you can have all sorts of developmental defects from giving them estradiol treatment. So you don't want to pass a certain threshold in the duration or the intensity of your estradiol treatment. This is the big one. How is this species sex determined? So you would think, oh yeah, you know, like when I first started this project, I didn't realize that there was such a variation in sex determination mechanisms within fish. Um, it's wild. And so they, some species, the males are the heterogametic sex like that of in, in mammals and humans. In other species, the females, the heterogametic sex, which is typical in birds, some of them, their sex determination mechanisms are, are in multiple locations across their genome on different autosomes. Some of them seems to be that the environment is the biggest factor in determining how many fish are male or female. And then there can be a combination of these mechanisms uh, going on within some species. So this is really the crux of whether or not um, a YY fish strategy will work for your species. And then are fish that are homozygous for the Y chromosome even a viable organism in your species? Typically they are because sex chromosomes in fish are very undifferentiated, but we've seen that that's not always the case. So we started catching some red shiner here in the Southwest and we started to um, develop aquaculture protocols and track their uh, development so that we can start to figure out the best timing for the estradiol treatments. And uh, so this was, a, this was a family effort. This was right around Thanksgiving. We built this large aquaculture system in a greenhouse here at the university. So no one was spared. This is my poor mother gluing PVC. These are some technicians here laying down some tanks. So like I said, a very collaborative effort. Um, and so then we were producing large numbers of these fish and we were able to produce them throughout the year. So we can definitely produce these fish. Like I was saying, they're, um, they're an invasive species. That's a very hardy species that need um, their water quality parameters are, um, 
they're not super picky about what where they're going to spawn or anything like that. So that was a pretty simple task to accomplish. But then we need to know how much estradiol to give them and how much, uh, how long to give them that treatment. So before I had any information, this was happening in tandem with my aquaculture um, paper. But I wanted to try to go ahead and see if I could get an effective sex reversal treatment that was, and I based the timing and dur uh, the duration, the timing and the concentration on what was effective for sex reversing goldfish over you know, 50 years ago. And so we did a treatment with 50 milligrams of estrile per kilogram of diet, 100 milligrams of estrile per kilogram of diet, and a control where we just treated the feed the same without the addition of the hormone. And this treatment lasted from two days post-hatch to 62 days post-hatch. So the fish start feeding around two days post-hatch. They don't have a big yolk sac or anything. So they start feeding um, uh, pretty early. And hopefully we were, I was gonna be able to sex reverse these fish without knowing their gonadal development or the timing of their gonadal development because fish are most susceptible to hormone treatments if they're exposed to the either the immersion into the hormone or the hormone treated feeds if you do it um, during their gonadal development and uh, at the beginning of their sexual differentiation so the way that you do this is through histology. You look at, you sample fish while they're aging. Um, so you pull out five, 10 fish when the fish are five days old, 10 days old, 15 days old, 30 days old, up to however long. And then you do histology. So we look at the gonad or the cellular development of these fish. And we saw that red shiner, um, they are undifferentiated gonochores, meaning that their gonads are just composed of these primary, primordial germ cells and they differentiate, they develop directly into ovaries or testes. Some fish, they go through this like rudimentary ovary phase and then they develop into testes, but these guys go straight from undifferentiated gonad to ovaries or, or testes. So we tracked the development of these fish and we saw that Females start to differentiate very early. Their gonads are starting to become obviously ovaries by 45 days old. But males, they're late bloomers and they don't start to have their testes really differentiate or develop until around 105 days old. And so if you remember, my first treatment ended at 60 days post-hatch. So we didn't even have fish that were starting to... Um, Go through their male differentiation from what we could tell from the histology work we we're doing. So we think that the treatment should have at least started by 45 days old and extend past 105 days old. So we needed to do another at least month or so of estradiol treatments. But um, you know, through that first part of this project, we saw that these fish do actually also mature very early. So by 130 days post-hatch, we were having spawns of red shiner um, from our captive reared population. And wild populations can um, hatch out in the spring and those young of year can start um, uh, reproducing by the end of the summer and they can actually uh, sire offspring even though they were born just a few months earlier. So uh, these fish are very highly fecund, have a very short maturation time. And we saw that the lay -bob period for giving them that treatment is between 45 days old to 105 days old. So, but how much estradiol should we give them? And, you know, we needed to redo this treatment. So we did a, oops, we did a high dose. There we, we did a higher dose here. Um, 150 milligrams, a medium dose and a low dose. And we extended the treatment. Um, so from two to 120 days post-hatch to 20 to 120 days post-hatch. This is just very conservative here. We could have done 40 to 100 possibly, but I really wanted just highly sex reverse fish. Um, and yeah, so we did a pretty long duration here. How you make the estradiol treated feed is you get paranoid about uh, feminizing yourself here, and then you 
uh, will just weigh out your estradiol that you buy from Sigma Eldritch or wherever. You dissolve it into ethanol, and then you mix it in with your your feed, your diet that you're feeding the fish, and the uh, estradiol will wick off and just leave the hormone adhered to the feed. So we grew these, the second sex reversal treatment, and we looked at the phenotypes once the fish were sexually developed. Once again, my mom sacrificing her, uh, I think this was a Christmas um, to come in because she couldn't pull me out of the lab. Uh, so this is, you know, external phenotypes. This is a female here and a male here. And then we also, just to make certain that we were completing these sex reversals, we looked at their gonads as well in order to sex these fish. And so this is the, these are the results of all the sex reversal treatments that we did. And if you see here, we have two treatments that resulted in 100% of the fish being female. So the, the, and those treatments were 50 milligrams of estrogen given from two to 120 days post-hatch or 100 milligrams of estrogen given from 20 to 120 days post-hatch. Now this treatment right here, 20 to 120 days post-hatch with a, at 100 milligrams of estrogen is I think the preferred treatment because it's a shorter duration, even though it's a higher concentration. So now we have uh, fish tanks that look like this, where you can't tell the difference between genetic males and genetic females. They all look, they all look female. So we need that sex ID marker to be able to tell us who is a genetic male. But the thing is, we didn't even know yet at this point what the sex determination system of Red Shiner was. And even if we have related species, um, just because you have species in the same genus doesn't mean that they're going to share the same sex determination system. It's not conserved within genuses, and sometimes it's not even conserved within a species. Different populations can have differing sex determination systems. So, I mean, this is evident based off of Western and Eastern mosquito fish, where Western mosquito fish, the female is the heterogametic sex, and Eastern mosquito fish, the male is the heterogametic sex. So, Genetic sex determinations vary um, widely. And so this just shows these are uh, genotypes of uh, African cichlids in the Rift Lakes. And you can have quantitative trait loci that are, you know, just autosomal loci across the genome that are dictating your sex. And you can have. Um, uh, on top of quantitative trait loci, you can also have uh, sex chromosomes. And so it's really like just the summation of um, either autosomal genes working together in conflict sometimes with a dominant sex chromosome. And all this can exist within a species as long as that sex ratio stays balanced. Um, and it's not, uh, you know, maladaptive. And then you have species like blue tilapia, where they have a dilocus sex determination system, where they have a dominant male um, suppressor gene on the W chromosome and a dominant male promoter gene on the Y chromosome. And the autosomes in that instance, how many sex modifying genes on the autosomes that that fish inherits would dictate what this fish's um, sexual phenotype would be if it had this particular type of genotype. So it's pretty messy. And then with the environment, it gets crazy. So you can put Southern flounder in a blue fish tank and they get stressed out for some reason. And that stress causes 99% of those fish to develop into males. You take these same flounder species, put them in a gray tank like this or a black tank, it's 50% male, 50% female. So these little details can really complicate um, your research. So you think, okay, we can just look at the sex chromosomes and be able to tell who is the, uh, 
if they do have sex chromosomes, who is going to be the heterogametic sex? So in humans, this is obviously a male human that has this weird little degenerated X chromosome that we call a Y chromosome. And we can see it's very different looking than the X chromosome. In fish, it's more like this, where the, all the sex chromosomes are homomorphic. They're all the same, but you'll have one little locus or maybe a few little loci on a couple of chromosomes that code the difference between a fish becoming male or female. So a good way to explore a fish's genome is by using actual genomic sequencing. And uh, so what we did was we created a reduced representation library of red shiner uh, genomes. And we employed single digest restriction site associated DNA sequencing. And what that is, is you have your DNA, you take restriction enzymes, and they go and they find these restriction cut sites. So they find an you know, ATGC or something along that, that they recognize, they make a cut wherever they see that sequence. And you get fragments of DNA that you can then do a size selection on so that you have analogous sequence or loci between males and females that you can compare between. And you can look for single nucleotide polymorphisms that are sex specific. So maybe there are this SNP is always heterozygous in males and always homozygous in females. Or you may find um, loci that are whole 150 base pair fragments of this from this process that are only present in one sex and absent in the other. So the sex that's present in would be the heterogametic sex and the sex that's absent in is the homogametic sex. So we use 11 males and 11 female red shiner to explore their, um, uh, their genomes and did all this bioinformatics work in order to find sex links, single nucleotide polymorphisms and rad tags, 150 um, base pair sequences that were found in one sex and absent in the other. And so we could develop a sex ID marker. So let's say that in a red shiner, uh, the male is heterogametic for the um, for the A base pair and the G base pair at this particular locus, and then females are homozygous for the A base pair. We can develop a fluorescent probe using it uh, with the TACMAN assay, where the male red shiner, the, that probe would find that heterozygous SNP and fluoresce green, whereas if it was a female, it would fluoresce red. And so a machine picks it up and you can see, okay, we have a cluster of green over here. All those individuals were male and this cluster of red, all those individuals were um, female. So that's how the actual sex ID marker works. So when we looked at Red Shiner, we found two sex ID markers that were pretty reliable. And um, we saw that they were always heterozygous in males and homozygous in females. So the males were CT for the sex ID marker XY248 um, and CC in females. And the sex ID marker was AG in red shiner males and AA in red shiner females for the sex ID marker XY170. So now we have a way that we can decipher who's a genetic male from a batch of females. But we need to be able to track once we take a thin clip and go back, run the genetics, and then be able to pull those fish out. So we have very small fish here with a lot of fish in each tank. How can we do that? Well, we actually were able to implant eight millimeter tags in red shiner that were as small as 35 millimeters total length. So these fish can really take a large tag for how small they are. And we genotyped 90 females from the uh, sex reversal trials and also tagged and genotyped 42 wild type males to spawn with the neo females. So any fish that was heterozygous for this SNP-170 were deemed neo-females and crossed with non-sibling heterozygous males or wild-type males. And so we can see our, our two genotypes here. We have our 
XY females here, and these are our XX females down here. So we can take those fish, put them in a tank together, spawn them, and these are the eggs that adhere to these stacks of tiles. Um, and so we get these, these little clusters of spawns like that, grow them out to where they're uh, able to start feeding on estradiol treated feed and where we can actually tell their, their sexual phenotype. And so we fed half of those larvae with the 100 milligram dosage and had the males, the YY fish that would have developed in that tank become phenotypic females. The other half of the spawn did not get treated feed, so we could also get YY males, but we also wanted to use this sex ratio data from this cross in order to really validate that these fish have an XXXY sex determination system. So if they do, then 25% of your fish represented by this little pink box here are gonna be female. And then if the YY fish are a viable organism, then 75% of your fish should be male without even looking at their genotype, right? So we should see something like this, a three to one male to female ratio. And by golly, we saw just that. We saw from that cross, um, that the sex ratio of the progeny from neo-females was not divergent from a three to one male to female sex ratio. And using similar rearing conditions, like I said, your rearing environment, the color of your tank can possibly affect your sex ratio, but using similar rearing conditions, neo-female spawns result in a progeny that were 77% male versus 50% male in wild type progeny. So, Pretty good evidence that these fish do have an XXXY sex determination system. So then when we do that cross, we can look at the genotype of, of these fish from this cross. So all these guys, you know, what's their genotype gonna be? And we see a third genotype pop up from that cross, obviously, right? So these are our YY males, and then these are our wild type males and our wild type females here. So, drum roll, these are your YY fish. So all this work, and we get these beautiful little critters right here. So we have um, these YY males that were not given the estradiol-treated diet and YY females that were given the estradiol-treated diet. But we did see that the YY fish are less susceptible to estradiol treatments. So when we sampled fish, we saw that all the neo-females that were given the, um, that XY, or I'm sorry, not neo-females, but this should be YY females that were given the 100 milligrams of estrile per kilogram of diet developed into phenotypic females. And that was based on histology of gonads. But when we started collecting these fish and putting them in tanks to spawn with YY males, um, Four out of 17 of those YY individuals from the shawl treatments that originally appeared to have female phenotypes upon stocking in spawning takes for our YY crosses developed male coloration after 30 days, which we did not see with our XY females. But even though, despite that male coloration, we did observe that some of these fish did have um, oocytes. So they still had ovaries, even though they had that male coloration. But we only did this with one fish. The other three fish, we just let them have a male phenotype and didn't really explore their gonads because we wanted to keep these fish for spawning trials. And the reason we wanted to, you would think, okay, we know these fish are homozygous for the male coding region. Um, so this should work, right? We don't need to do anything further. We don't need to test anymore with these YY fish. But what we want to know is, do YY fish always produce all male offspring? Because with species like, once again, tilapia that are very complicated, but um, Nile tilapia, you can have YY males that produce only, or they produce mostly male offspring, but some females pop up in that cross because of sex modifying genes on autosomes. So we wanted to see if that 
may happen with red shiner. And so I'm still work, or I'm still pulling fish out of tanks now, even though I'm supposed to be defending in six weeks. But um, we're seeing so far that progeny from YY fish um, are resulting in 100% male offspring. And so that's what we're seeing so far. Um, and we're seeing that these fish are viable. The YY males are viable. Their fitness seems to be uh, decent compared to um, the XY, their XY counterparts. And even YY females that are given that shadow treatment uh, have um, a good comparable fecundity as compared to XX females. So we know these fish are viable organism in this species. Um, and so in conclusion with all this, we see that the most appropriate dosages for giving fish um, estradiol, estradiol treated feeds would be a hundred milligram dosage fed from 20 to 120 days post hatch or a 50 milligram dosage fed from um, two to 120 days post hatch. Those result in 100% female cohorts. Something to note with all of our estradiol treatment tanks, we did see abnormal ovary development, but it was very rare and it also did not impact us being able to produce YY fish. Um, but something we could try is a 50 milligram estradiol treatment from 20 to 120 days post hatch, some, something that we didn't try because the less estradiol we give the fish, the better. Um, just because estradiol can have adverse effects on their development and health. And also for regulatory purposes, giving the fish lower dosages of estradiol for a shorter duration is preferable. But we may need to increase the duration or dosage of estradiol treatments to obtain 100% female cohorts of the YY fish. And so this has been seen in multiple species where YY fish are more resistant to sex reversals. Um, and so we just may need to bump up that estradiol dosage a little bit. And this is a great news here that Red Shiner do have an XX, XY uh, male, XX female, XY male sex discrimination system, and that YY fish appear to develop and reproduce normally. So the final steps of the dissertation is to continue assessing the sex ratio from YY verification crosses. We want to see that YY males and YY females, when they spawn together, they produce normal offspring that are all YY males. We want to see that YY males with XX females produce all male wild type offspring. And then we want to see YY females spawn with wild type males, that they are also producing um, all male offspring and that they, YY females could be a good Trojan sex chromosome carrier, those could be the fish for this species that we release into an invasive population. Uh, so the next steps are, is that I'm gonna be staying on as a research scientist at the University of Arizona, and we're gonna actually start modeling um, the use of red shiner in some study site or some like model streams in Arizona. And so this is a very important aspect of seeing if a Trojan sex chromosome strategy is going to work for your species is to run some models that take in life history parameters such as fecundity, um, uh, maturation time, and obviously the longevity of the species in order to determine how many fish need to go into that system and you know what percentage of that population needs to be YY individuals in order for it to start to skew towards male. And so the thing about the YY fish strategy is it looks like it's going to be most effective when it's coupled with traditional removal efforts. So you can have um, extremely long duration before you start to see extirpation if you do not use traditional removal efforts and you have a relatively low stocking rate of YY males. And so these is, this is a paper that came out um, by one of my committee members, Daniel Schill, and it looked at using manual suppression along with YY male stocking and how quickly you can 
extirpate a population. And so he's what he's been trying to do in actual field trials now is to remove roughly half the fish and replace them with YY males. And he's actually seeing that he's getting um, all, he's close to having all male populations in some of his, his experimental trials, his field trials. And it's been less than four years. So his model may have been a little conservative, but this is going to be case by case, right? So it depends on if your study site, if you're with the drainage you're managing or the streams you're managing have the right uh, lack of connectivity or, and what the population, how robust the population of invasives are in that, um, in that stream that you're managing. So I plan on using Aravipa Creek as a sort of model system. Um, so Aravipa Creek uh, contains two endangered species and it's a, the upper stretches above the fish barrier have uh, pretty great populations of native fishes and um, downstream you have a lot, just a lot of long fin dace and red shiner, but there are red shiner in the um, above the fish barrier. So I would like to model releasing uh, red shiner YY males and or YY females um, to wipe out a population below the fish barrier and above the fish barrier. And so that's those are the next steps for, for my research. And like I was saying, there are so many people involved in uh, this project and it's been um, a very enriching and frustrating and fun and relieving and exciting and depressing experience um, all at the same time. But it's been a blast and uh, I'm really glad to be a part of it and to have all these people help me along the way. So. If you have any questions, um, you know, I'll be staying on for a few minutes here, but you can also email me at chadteal at arizona.edu. And I just want to thank you all so much for your time uh, this morning. Great. Thank you so much, Chad. That was a great presentation and congratulations on our, all your work. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think... Uh, we just got a question in the chat from Dan Leavitt. Um, he said, very interesting research and well described. Can you expand on the interactions between red shiner and native fish? Are they competing for resources or predating on some? Um, there was a big size difference with some of your native early slides. Just right. curious how the threat is exhibited. How can a Colorado pike minnow get taken out by a red shiner, right? So, um, larval predation so uh, it's it's they're completely they are completely um opportunistic they're generalist they're they're an impress i have so much reverence for red shiner but they will eat um they will eat larvae of of larger fish but they also they're mostly associated with competition with other small bodied fishes um so you know spike days they have a great um, track record of out competing those fish and and pushing them out. Um, so competition and predation actually are the two mechanisms that they suppress native fishes. Awesome, thank you. No problem. Um, another question: Could you um, in a in a couple minutes kind of report your results for the green sunfish side? Of yeah, things? absolutely. So the green sunfish. Uh, they're the species when I was kind of going rambling through how this project has been from an emotional standpoint, they were the species that I was really leaning in on like the depressing, aggravating thing because they, um, centrarchids in general, sunfishes do have very complicated sex determination systems. And so they're very amenable to estradiol treatments through green sunfish but we think that they may have a ZZZW sex determination system based off our genetic research. And all this is out in the literature now. Um, but we think they have a ZZZW sex determination system with possibly environmental effects on top of it. So we had heavily male skewed cohorts from our control tanks. 
between 75 to 100 percent male um, fish from our fish that were given no estradiol or anything. And so we couldn't develop a reliable sex ID marker. Um, we couldn't find any significant differences between males and females as far as their genomics um, or their genetics. And uh, so what you could do is if you don't have a reliable sex ID marker, you could just take sex reverse fish and spawn them with non-sex reverse fish. And then you could use the sex ratio from that cross as evidence to what their sex determination system is. But since we had heavily male skewed sex ratios in wild type crosses, it would be impossible for us to decipher between, distinguish between environmental effects versus that sex ratio just result, versus that sex ratio resulting from us actually finding a sex reverse male. So we need to go in and figure out what environmental factors, if any, might be causing male skewed sex ratios in that species. And then I think we should explore the genetics using other approaches using transcriptomes, using something like that. So, yeah. That's very complicated, but very interesting. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, I don't, don't lose hope on green sunfish. It just, I'm tapped out on them as far as finances and time and sweat for now. And so I think there's possibility of using green sunfish, YY or WW, or not WW, ZZ males. We, no, ZZ females would be that person's sex chromosome carrier. So I think there's more research to be done for sure on those guys. Awesome. All right. So we have another question um, that Tom Turner kind of answered, but I'll, I'll read it and you can add to it if you want. The question was, is there any concern about interbreeding of native fish with red shiner? Um, and yeah, Tom no. said no evidence thus far, but interesting to see whether YY males would have a higher propensity. So do you have anything to add to that? That's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I definitely uh, do not believe that the red shiner are gonna be able to hybridize with um, spike dace or loach minnow for sure. Um, but, you know, we have species of beautiful shiner or populations of beautiful shiner like down in the Chiricahuas and um, they look eerily similar to red shiner. Uh, I haven't seen anything in the literature about hybridization occurring between those two species, but that's, I think that's something that should be looked into. Other questions? All right, not seeing or hearing from anyone. Um, yeah, like like Chad said, feel free to email him um, if you do think of additional questions or comments. Um, oops. I'm gonna close this out real quick here. We'll have a few minutes early. Um, just thank you everyone for, for taking the time to join us. Um, like we said, this webinar was recorded and will be available in the next couple days on our YouTube channel, which I think um, Carly just posted in the chat. Um, and you can also find all our previous webinars there as well. Um, we also encourage you to visit CCAST and our case study dashboard where we currently have about 166 case studies. Our next webinar is actually next week. It's the exact same time uh, next Tuesday. That one will be from Jeff Jenis of Jenis Enterprises, who will be speaking about bullfrogs of the Williams Ranger District on Kaibab National Forest. Um, please contact us if you would like to receive these webinar announcements and aren't already on our mailing list. Um, thank you again for all your time and especially thank you, Chad, for joining us and giving us this excellent presentation.
Um, and yeah, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.